All right. It is now time for another live reading from my 2011 book, Reason Fulfilled by Revelation, the Christian Philosophy Debates in France. And we have finished the long, almost 100 pages long, historical introduction. And we are going to today dive into the first of the translated documents um, titled, Is There a Christian Philosophy by Emile Brahier, who is a fairly young scholar at the time, kind of a young Turk, as we often call people like that. Some people might have called him a young punk, but <laughs> he had uh, already established himself as a historian of philosophy. This was published in the Revue de Metaphysique et de la Morale, um, in 1931, in the uh, volume 38, number two, so that would place it in the summer. And um, it's it's kind of a longish piece. It is pages 99 through 127, so <clears throat> may take me the entire hour to read it. We'll see. And uh, it's it's quite an interesting piece. Um, hopefully we'll have time for Q&A afterwards. So I'm going just to <clears throat> start in on this. And it's divided into, uh, I believe, yeah, six sections. And each has to do with, or no, sorry, five sections. Each has to do with a uh, particular era of philosophy. So no further ado. In a note in his The Christian Philosophy of St. Augustine, uh, Monsieur Gilson says that it would be appropriate to submit the concept of Christian philosophy to re-examination. In matters of the history of ideas, questions are in actuality often more difficult to set out than they are to resolve once they are set out. We have to deal not only with defined entities, but with human thoughts that struggle for and seek an equilibrium ceaselessly compromised by the research itself. Fixed concepts are at the end of history, within an imaginary horizon. They are not at the beginning like completely finished things, just waiting for a thought that examines them in order to declare itself in agreement or disagreement. Let us refrain, then, from first defining philosophy and Christianity in order to seek out, using these concepts as a framework, whether there is a Christian philosophy. We would run too much risk of finding in our conclusions only what our prejudices would have put into our definitions. Perhaps, then, one will say that the difficulty here is more normative, dans le droit, than factual, dans le fait. If it is just a matter of Christian philosophy's existence, will not historical experience provide us with a sufficient answer? by showing us the existence of doctrines that claim that title. But we shall reply, these doctrines must still justify the title, and that is a matter for the historian's judgment. The history of philosophy cannot be a passive, simple notation of facts. One of its most important functions is to investigate what the doctrines it studies really are and if they are always what they profess to be. The historian must discover underneath their apparent and social existence the thoughts that produce them, or more simply, ask how they justify their existence. The question of Christian philosophy, the question of the existence of Christian philosophy, cannot be a pure question of fact. But in this case, is there not a circumstance that deprives history of any right to judge by its ordinary method? Indeed, who can say what is Christian and what is not? Who can lay down the law if not a magisterium? That doubtless takes different forms according to the variety of Christian confessions, but that alone has the power to define orthodoxy. In any case, this authority that admits or excludes matters very little here. It assumes in advance, actually, that Christian philosophy is possible because it finds itself ready to receive as well as to condemn. It matters little to us what more or less ephemeral value ecclesiastical politics has conferred on this or that system. Our question is broader. We are asking what Christianity's intellectual vocation is, what its positive part is in the development of philosophical thought. So, section one. 
Western thought was formed in a Christian land. That is a fact. But that Christianity spread out within regions that were impregnated by Greek culture and that had never known any other culture is another fact. During all the Middle Ages, matters of the intellect had belonged solely to the clergy and the monastic orders. That is true. But it is no less true that intellectual civilization has transformed itself since the 16th century. Once initiative ceased to come from the clergy, so much that on a first view, it is not evident that Christianity played an important role. From the start, there was, we know, the feeling of a great disagreement between the Hellenic tradition of philosophy and the new beliefs. For the Hellene, the true object of philosophy was to discover order or the cosmos, each being and principally the directive forces of nature, souls, and God must be defined by the exact and nevrariter place that it occupies in this eternal order. We must also notice the sort of intellectual scandal that Christianity produced once pagan philosophers came to know it, starting from the second century of our era and the impression they felt of its genuine absurdity. What could it be for them? This worldless God who throughout an eternity remains inactive and then all of a sudden sets himself to create according to his will. What is the pretended goodness of God who waits centuries to manifest himself by redemption, who changes nature in order to incarnate himself, who transforms the order he has established? There is a nearly indignant tone in all of these interrogations, which are repeated without a break from Celsus's true discourse in the second century of our era until the last of the pagan Neoplatonists. On their side, the Christians did not feel the disagreement any less. The affirmation of the eternity of the world in particular, the affirmation of an immovable order that perfectly satisfied reason and the taste for beauty shocked them as a heresy, the Hellenic heresy par excellence, which refuses to admit in things a genuine history and unpredictable initiatives such as creation, sin, and redemption. Will Christianity then, in these conditions, create for itself its own philosophy, be an initiator of a new intellectual movement? In the first centuries of our era, we do not see anything like that. To the contrary, Christians like Justin the Apologist, like Origen, like St. Gregory of Nazianus or St. Gregory of Nyssa, like St. Augustine, annex everything they can from pagan philosophy to Christianity. Where have we seen, where could one see the fathers having been authors of a new intellectual culture different from that which pagan antiquity had transmitted to them? There is, first of all, an entire part of that culture that was neither altered nor touched by Christianity, and that is the part that consists of the sciences preliminary to philosophy, what during the Middle Ages were called the seven arts, grammar, rhetoric, dialectic, arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. They preserved not only in St. Augustine's works, but throughout the Middle Ages, the habits of mind created by the Hellenes, that spirit of exactitude which cannot satisfy itself except by using well-defined and well-articulated concepts or a precise calculus. But above all, it is the last two of these sciences, mathematics and astronomy, which from the 16th century on, regaining the level Greek antiquity had brought them to and starting the course of progress again with Galileo and Descartes, transform the conception of the universe and of man. St. Augustine, who transmitted the traditional scientific culture of his time without changing anything in it, has he at least transformed the pagan Greek philosophy into a Christian philosophy? No more than his predecessors. And just as he learned Greek science in the books of the orators and the sophists, he later learned philosophy in the books of Plotinus and the Neoplatonists. It is this purely pagan philosophy that he transmits to posterity, particularly to the first centuries of the Middle Ages, for which he was one of the great authorities, but also in the 17th century, when all of the great systems, particularly of Descartes and Malebranche, were penetrated by the Augustinian spirit. Beginning with St. Augustine, there is then a very important tradition that we could believe to be that of Christian philosophy if we did not note that this claimed Christian philosophy is borrowed entirely from Plotinus and Plato. But if St. Augustine, no more than any of the fathers, did not truly create a philosophy, a new conception of the universe, how, being a Christian, was he able to integrate with his thought a philosophy that, by its spirit, we have seen is not only foreign but completely opposed to the dogmas of the Catholic religion?
It is known that at the time when St. Augustine became acquainted with the Neoplatonic books and Latin translations, in particular Marius Victor's translations of Plotinus's Aeneads, a little before 387, towards the age of 32, he was not yet converted to Christianity, but he was soon to be. Until then, his mind was little oriented in philosophy's direction. The rhetorician's profession he carried out corresponded to a purely formal education, having no other goal than the art of speaking well, uninterested in ideas in a deep way, an education quite widespread as antiquity, in antiquity as it came to its end. On the other side, his adherence to the Manichaean sect would soon have turned him away from philosophy. As with numerous religious sects of that epoch, they were more occupied with rites and ceremonies than with speculation on the universe. It is in these conditions that in 387 the intellectual and moral crisis took place that ended in his conversion to Christianity. Therefore, Augustine was moved and fascinated by Platonic philosophy during the same period that he sensed the truth of the gospel. It is from the very year of his conversion to Christianity that certain of his philosophical treatises date, such as Contra Academicos, De Beata Vita, De Ordine, and Soliloquies, where he shows himself the faithful imitator of Platonic and where we discover entire passages from the Aeneads. In a word, his conversion to Platonism did not appear to him at that moment from an intellectual point of view, something different from his conversion to Christianity. In the Aeneads, he finds the same basis of spirituality as in the Gospels, and he attaches himself with the same passion to both. The very mystery he saw in the Aeneads, the depth of wisdom that he admitted not yet having penetrated, all this gives a truly religious accent to what he said about Plotinus's work. Thus, St. Augustine should have had, for a longer or shorter period of time, the illusion that the true philosophy was not something different from the Christian religion. What is no less certain is that this illusion did not persist. Little by little, once the primitive passion gave way to more reflection, we see him become conscious of the divergences separating Platonism from dogma and perceive their deep incompatibility. Toward the end of his life, 72 years old, when he was revising his own treatises, he wrote, musing about the time when he discovered Plotinus, the praise I made of Plato and the Platonists displeases me, and not without reason, All uh, above all because Christian doctrine has to be defended against great errors on their part. In the interval, uh, 40 years separating these two dates, we glimpse Augustine's mistrust towards Greek philosophy grow little by little, but not at all in order to replace it by another philosophy that would be, quote, the Christian philosophy. It is in a famous passage of the Confessions that he show, clearly shows his attitude with respect to Platonism. And therein I read, not indeed in the same words, but to the same effect, enforced by many and diverse reasons that, quote, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything that was made. That which was made by him is, quote, life, and the life was the light of men. And that, the soul of man, although it bears witness to the light, yet itself is not that light, but the word of God being God is that true light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. In like manner I read there that the word of God was born not of flesh, nor of blood, nor of the will of man, nor the will of flesh, but of God. But that the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, I read not there but that he emptied himself and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross, whereupon God also hath greatly exalted him from the dead and hath given him a name, which is above all names. Those books have not. For that before all times and above all times, thy only begotten son remained unchangeably co-eternal with thee and that of his his fullness, souls receive that they may be blessed, and by participation in the wisdom remaining in her, herself, them they are renewed, that they may be wise is there. But that in due time Christ died for the ungodly, and that thou sparest not your only son, but delivered him up for us all, is not there. Because thou hast hid those things from the wise and the prudent and hast revealed them to babes. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. 
it is difficult to find a page richer, more significant, and more full of meaning for the question with which we are concerned. St. Augustine is condensed into a single dogma, all the content of philosophy. This dogma is the one of an eternal and immovable logos or word by whose intermediation all things were made and thanks to whom the human soul knows them in their immovable order. He condenses, on the other hand, the entire Christian religion into a dogma, the dogma of the incarnate word who made himself man in order to save man. On both sides, it is a matter of the word, of the logos. On both sides, the defining formulas, whether of the eternal word who remains with God as an instrument of creation or the word incarnated for men are borrowed from the prologue to the fourth gospel as if St. Augustine wanted first to indicate that the two conceptions of the word are equally Christian. But that is not the case, however, for if we continue reading the confessions, we will soon perceive that for him, this intelligence of the eternal word acquired by philosophy is worth nothing in the true religious life, which is the quest for salvation. Quote, but having read, having then read those books of the Platonists and being admonished by them to seek for incorporeal truth, I saw thy invisible things understood by the things that are made, assured that thou wert and wert infinite and yet not diffused in space finite or infinite. Of these things was I indeed assured, yet too weak to enjoy thee. I, I chattered as one well skilled, but I had not sought thy way in Christ our Savior." I would have proved not skillful, but ready to perish. For now, filled with my punishment, I had begun to desire to seem wise, yet I mourned, uh, yet mourned I not, but rather was puffed up with knowledge. He wanted thus to mark the distance, the very abyss between an autonomous philosophical knowledge, certain of itself, but on its own completely useless and even harmful to salvation and the religious life completely independent of the intellectual life. As for philosophy itself, it is not presupposed by religion any more than it presupposes religion, but it is at least compatible with Christianity. That is what we might at first be able to believe while reading that single passage of the confession. But let us look more closely. St. Augustine, we say, has condensed the pagan philosophy completely into the doctrine of the eternal word. This expression seems at first to suggest a doctrine that is not only hostile to Christianity, but not only is not hostile to Christianity, but even has a Christian ring to it, since it comes from the prologue to the fourth gospel. In reality, that is not the case. The word that St. Augustine speaks here speaks of here, designates the logos or reason that the Stoics made the cause of the connective matrix between things in the world, or even the noose or intelligence whose eternal thoughts constituted, according to the Platonists, the intelligible world of which the sensible world was an imitation. To explain it even more simply, let us recall that the goal of Greek philosophy was to investigate the rational, consequently immovable and fixed order that is in things. The universal logos or intelligence is only the metaphysical realization, the projection of this need. It is set up within the ideal, the very order that the sensible world realizes more or less imperfectly. But the doctrine of the eternal word so understood has corollaries that are clearly incompatible with Christian faith, namely the eternity of the order that translates itself in the imagination by the affirmation of the eternity of the world and the eternity of souls, since souls are only particular aspects of the universal logos and they collaborate in the order of the world. Thus, the theory of the eternal word, or if you like, of the rational order of things grasped in its fullness with all of its consequences, is incompatible with Christian faith, so much that we end up in this veritable incoherence. St. Augustine is led to reject as false because, contrary to the faith, consequences of a philosophy whose principle he nevertheless admits. When the eternity of souls is the matter under discussion, he sets into play against it the revelation that teaches us that God has created the soul. Why, he asks, not rather believe God in matters that escape the human mind's inquiries. And as to the eternity of the world, he requires us to choose between this doctrine and 
and the supernatural end religion proposes. We know indeed that the eternity of the world was imagined by the thinkers of Greece under the form of an indefinite series of cycles or great years that would repeat themselves. Whence this reflection of St. Augustine, quote, how is it true beatitude in the eternity one cannot believe in if there is always a return of the same miseries? And in any case, Christ died only once. Consequently, there is not at all in St. Augustine's works a Christian philosophy, that is to say a conception of the universe grafted onto dogma. The only philosophy that he might know, the only one we might find in his works, is the philosophy of Plato and Plotinus. St. Augustine did not know any other intellectual culture than the pagan and human culture, one might say, and he does not ask Christian belief for it, for a moment, he was able to have the thought that Plato's spirituality coincided with Christ's teaching, but he did not hang on to it. And philosophy remains in his work like a foreign body, its existence always threatened. All right, next section, section two of Emile Brayer's Is There a Christian Philosophy? Down the length of centuries, up into the beginning of the 13th century, the Western Middle Ages knew the predominance of Augustinianism, that is, that mixture of attraction and repulsion for philosophy that brings it about that sometimes philosophy is considered to be a sort of illumination entirely akin to religion, sometimes, to the contrary, viewed as an enemy. But in the 13th century, an attempt to had a synthesis between philosophy and Christianity was produced, a completely new one. This is the one Thomas authored. It is no longer a matter of gathering philosophy and religion together, as St. Augustine believed possible. St. Thomas considers philosophy a distinct and autonomous science proceeding from purely rational arguments without borrowing anything from revelation. But still more, he tries to demonstrate how and why this philosophy is not and cannot be opposed at all to Christian revelation. Thus, how this incompatibility we believe to have found between the Hellenic mind and the religion of salvation does not exist. How philosophy, purely rational, can and must become the intellectual aspect of Christian culture. Philosophy in St. Thomas's works is not at all a part of religion. It is the work of human reason, and it does not give itself as collaborating in salvation in any determinate way. But on the other hand, it is no longer a weapon against Christianity. It enters like an integrating element into the Christian life, which is no less intellectual than religious. And in conformity to the 13th century's universalist tendencies, St. Thomas strives especially to restore the unity of culture under the sign of the cross. Beginning with the end of the 12th century and at the beginning of the 13th, the totality of Aristotle's works came to be known in the West. It is difficult to form a picture of the intellectual agitation caused by the revelation of a genius who is so fundamentally foreign to Christianity and who's in whose works the specific traits of the Hellenic mind manifested their depth in a way different than in what remained of Platonism. Of those who had been up till then the great directors of Western thought, St. Augustine and Boethius, the first had been almost completely unaware of Aristotle's work, and the second had made known only a few logical treatises, providing nothing of the comprehensive view of the universe and of man contained in Aristotle's system. Platonism, in the form that had infiltrated th through the church fathers, most of the time anonymous and mutilated, reduced to the minuscule portion that could be reconciled more or less easily with Christian theology, presented itself not as a system but a more or less vague spiritualism. On the contrary, Aristotelianism forms a whole with its systematic assemblage of well-connected theorems bearing on all realities from God to matter. This is the first time that Western Christianity finds itself face-to-face -face with no intermediary with a production of the Hellenic genius. And how much, in order to truly understand it, habits of thought had to be altered and in a way, the mind center of gravity displaced. I am thinking here not only of the heterodox doctrines one naturally finds in Aristotle's work, the eternity of the world opposed to creation and time, the soul existing only as the principle of the body's life. I am thinking above all of the tonality of the totality that marks in his works preoccupations diverging so much from those of Christianity up to then. 
All Platonism actually, and this is what in it had seduced St. Augustine, was oriented towards theology and the world of eternal and intelligible beings. Inversely, all of Aristotle's system is oriented towards the explanation of sensible things. God barely appears there as the eternal mover of the heavens. In Aristotle's work, the proper object of philosophy is the nature of the heavens, the elements, minerals, animals, man considered in his earthly conduct insofar as citizen or scholar. Man's intellectual knowledge is itself completely engaged in the sensible. Nothing, in, it, nothing is in the understanding that has not been in sense. Intellect is not, therefore, an intuitive vision of stable and permanent realities. It operates by abstractions that separate in the sensible data, the common elements that form the genera and the species. There is nothing, therefore, in human nature, such as it is described in Aristotle's works, that makes one presage, even from afar, the supernatural drama in which the soul is in engaged, and which alone gives Christian life meaning. One cannot dream up a deviation more complete than that which was in, imposed on Christian thinkers by meditation on Aristotle's works. One can insist as much as one likes that Aristotle's peripateticism is currently tied to Christian scholasticism by an indissoluble bond, but it was not always so. And in the 13th century, this conviction went against all traditions and against the most enlivened inclinations. What was, in fact, the attitude at first of the spiritual powers faced with these new forces coming from a far-off pre-Christian past? An attitude of defiance. Bands against reading and teaching Aristotle's philosophy were multiplied. In 1215, at the same time that Pope Innocent III founded the University of Paris and gave it its statutes, he enjoined the masters not to read the metaphysics or the physics and permitted them the logical treatises. His successor, Gregory IX, was no less obliged to give ground, at least partially for he permitted an expurgated Aristotle in which everything that could be contrary to dogma had been effaced. We see the real worries of the powers who had as their mission safeguarding Catholicism's unity. But St. Thomas used a completely different means than the popes and the cons councils to vanish Aristotle. He did not fight him. He did not critique him. He adopted him. The principle... St. Thomas started from is extremely simple. It is this, truth cannot be contrary to truth. An obvious principle, since it returns in some to the principle of non-contradiction. Actually, if a truth were contrary to a truth, one would have to say that a single and same thing could be at the same time true and false. What is important is not the principle, but the way in which it will be applied. The application St. Thomas wants to draw from it concerns the truths revealed by religion and the truths discovered by philosophy. Revealed truth cannot be contrary to philosophical truth, nor philosophical truth to the truth of faith. Logic does not ask that these truths elicit or demand each other, as Augustine, who reconciled philosophical illumination with the faith of the Christian, had sometimes thought. It asks only that they do not destroy each other. But let us suppose that, in fact, faith supplies us with propositions contrary to those that philosophy admits. And this is not a gratuitous supposition, for contrarieties of this type abound in particular cases. Aristotle's philosophy does indeed deny things that faith affirms. For example, faith tells us the world was created in time. Aristotle tells us, the world is uncreated and exists from all eternity. In order to apply our principle here, we must know which of these two propositions we will hold as true. For a Christian, the solution is clear. It's faith that speaks the truth. But if a truth of reason cannot be contrary to a truth of faith, it follows that Aristotle's thesis is only in appearance a truth of reason. In these cases, either Aristotle reasoned badly or he approached a question that reason was completely powerless to resolve. But if faith is the, thus the measure of truth, how can we still talk about the autonomy of reason? St. Thomas's goal is to show the convergence of the two great movements that dominate the spiritual history of our West, Greek rationalism represented by Aristotle and Christian faith. One can speak of convergence only if each of these two movements has its own initiative, its own internal development. Yeah. <laughs>
but reason no longer possesses its own initiative once the results of its own activity are judged by a criterion that is foreign to it by faith. A Thomist will respond, perhaps, that faith does not alter, but on the contrary strengthens reason, for it has a purely negative role, that of excluding certain propositions that are incompatible with it, and it does not intervene at all in the positive labor that establishes them, so much that, faced with the exclusiveness of faith, which attacks certain propositions philosophy believed itself to have demonstrated, reason is led to examine itself and to become conscious of its own powers and its own limits. Thomism thus presents us with this surprising paradox of maintaining together the old medieval formula, Philosophia Ancilla Theologiae, and the Hellenic formula of the autonomy of reason. Faith exercises its censorship over philosophy, but does not provide it any positive assistance, any impetus. Such is the sense in which Thomism is a Christian philosophy. Not at all that Christianity would have contributed any positive element or image of the universe, since it borrows this image from a Greek thinker, but that philosophy is certain not to deviate from the straight line thanks to the censorship faith exercises over it. This is the only way in which a philosophy whose preconceptions were not uniquely and purely theological could develop within the interior of Christianity. For this censorship to be able to fill, fulfill its role and so to give birth to a Christian philosophy, two conditions are needed, conditions whose possible fulfillment St. Thomas's contemporaries denied. The first is that one could say with exactitude from among the philosophical pr propositions, which ones are contrary to the faith? The second is that reason, once considered as autonomous and spontaneous, could accept a control that does not come from itself. Let us consider the first difficulty. We know that many of Aristotle's philosophical propositions accepted by St. Thomas were condemned by ecclesiastical authority, notably by the Bishop of Paris, Tempier, in 1277. Let us consider two of them, which are particularly instructive. The first is the impossibility of plurality of worlds. Aristotle had demonstrated in the Dicaeolo that it is impossible there be more than one single world, and he had based his demonstration on the nature of the elements. St. Thomas, by accepting this demonstration, was wrong to limit the infinite power of God. The second is the thesis called that of the individuation by matter. According to Aristotle, what distinguishes one man from another, Peter from Paul, is not their essence, which is the same in both of them, but is an entire ensemble of accidents due to the conditions of time and of place in which the specific form had to be produced. One individual is therefore not fundamentally distinct from another except by accidents, depending on fleeting circumstances. But for a Christian, accepting such a view, uh, such a way of viewing things is a serious matter. For the immortal subject of a supernatural destiny taught by Christianity is the permanent individual. Aristotle's thesis that risks confusing individuals in the species. Still, be these two theses, whose orthodoxy St. Thomas's adver adversary suspected, St. Thomas himself considered as perfectly reconcilable with orthodoxy, which proves at least that the criterion of faith censorship is far from being something clear and easily applicable. We have a decisive proof of this in a famous discussion that St. Thomas undertook on the subject of the eternity of the world. His, this thesis is closely connected with the Hellenic mind and in particular with peripateticism. Even more, it was supposed by the first and most important of the arguments that prove God's existence. This is the famous argument known as the argument from the first mover. God is only actually proven as the mover of the heavens, and if in its turn the movement of the heavens is not eternal, their mover would become entirely useless. St. Thomas, who attaches an extreme importance to that proof, who sees in it actually the sole means by which human reason bound up in the sensible world can arrive at the borders of theology and can know God as one knows a cause from its effect, does not conceal that there is a serious objection here. Two reasons, he says, seem to weaken this proof. The first is that it proceeds from the supposition of the eternity of the world that among Catholics is supposed to be false. Still, and this is what is most astonishing to his contemporaries, he does not consider that the Aristotelian thesis of the eternity of the world is precisely the contrary 
of the Christian thesis of creation. And he deploys the greatest subtlety to establish there is no disagreement between the two of them. The word creation, he tells us, in substance signifies a certain connection of causality. A creative cause is that which produces from nothing a being with all of its attributes. Then, he continues, this definition does not contain anything that implies that this cause began to act at a certain moment in time. We can set back the beginning of the action of this cause as far back as we like, without ceasing to conceive of it as creative. In particular, we can set it back to infinity and say that it never started to act because it had been eternally in action. From this point on, it's possible to conceive an eternal world that was still, however, created by this reason that it was created since eternity. It is not certain that this claimed agreement does not conceal a very deep disagreement. St. Thomas, with his attempt at reconciliation, ends up doing wrong to both Aristotle and the Bible. Let's examine the principle of argumentation by which Aristotle and the physics demonstrates the eternity of the world. This argument is founded on the nature of time. Time taken in, in itself is continuous. That is, it is such that no present moment could be the current limit of a time that is past. There cannot be a moment that would be the first. Then the argument continues, time is the measure of movement. It cannot exist without there also existing a regular and periodic movement that it would have to measure. This movement is the movement of the heavens from which derives the division of time into period. The movement of the heavens has not had a beginning and the world is eternal. What matters to us the most is less the content of the proof than the way of proving. It is the very type of way peculiar to a Hellene. The proof is based on the consideration of the fixed nature or essence of things. It is the nature of the world to be eternal because time, which has not had a beginning, cannot exist without it. Let us consider to the contrary the way in which the matter is presented in Thomas's work. If the world is eternal, it would be because it would have pleased God to create it from eternity. If it was created in time, it's because it pleased God to do that. The eternity of the world, if it existed, would not therefore flow from its nature, but from a will of God, which is for us purely arbitrary, which belongs only to history and which we cannot know except by revelation. There is a complete antithesis between Hellenic reason proceeding from clear and defined concepts and Christian dogma, the divine comedy, where one sees only persons acting in a supernatural and unpredictable manner. These examples will suffice, perhaps, to show how far the use of this censorship of philosophy of faith was indecisive, imprecise, arbitrary. This censorship that St. Thomas wished to use to determine what in philosophy was both rational and acceptable to a Christian. But supposing this starting point possible, we encounter a difficulty that is not the smallest one. We all know that Thomism vaunts itself above all on respecting the autonomy of reason. It's no less true that reason needs some sort of religious tutelage, since in the last resort, faith is called in to exclude from philosophy theses that are contrary to faith. Human reason cannot be completely certain of the value of its own demonstrations. For theses that faith reject are the theses it, is be it believed to have demonstrated. Once faith speaks, philosophy is so to speak, required to seek out in what it claimed as demonstration, some sophism or paralogism hidden up to then. Consequently, Thomism always supposes that reason is incapable of finding in itself its own measure and its own rule. Here then is a conception of reason very narrowly tied to the Thomist idea of a Christian philosophy. Human reason has, according to St. Thomas, two interdependent aspects. It is not intuitive, that is to say, it does not directly know the essence of things. It is limited to the domain of general ideas that it abstracts from sensible things. Consequently, we cannot have the illusion of knowing the real nature of anything. Moreover, reason discusses and argues much more than it demonstrates. It is made less to discover truths than to judge whether the proposed theses are true or false. The single method of philosophy is to set out systematically following each thesis the arguments pro and contra and to show through a discussion which ones are the most decisive. 
two aspects, we can, we say, that are interdependent. For it is, in fact, because the mind can never attain adequate conceptions of the reality of things, which does not suppose less than the participation in the knowledge of the essence of things, such as they are in the divine understanding, that the philosopher can grasp only fragments and limited aspects of things, which forces him into endless discussions. In Thomism, human reason is thus entirely infirm and feeble, both by its field of exploration, which renders it dependent on the senses, and by the incomplete and imperfect way by which it penetrates them. In the series of created intellects, it is at the lowest degree well below angelic intellects. This assessment of human reason is a completely necessary element in the economy of doctrine. It is this type of congenital weakness that takes from, from it all its weapons for resisting faith's admo admonishments. We have in this a particularly clear example in the way St. Thomas rejects as contrary to the faith one of the most well-known Aristotelian theses, that of the identity <coughs> of all human intellects. The principle of this thesis is the following. In intellectual knowing, the knowing subject becomes completely identical to the known object. To the degree that we know things scientifically, all that is individual in our knowing is erased. And at the limit in scientific contemplation, there is nothing more in our mind than the object we know. All trace of individuality has disappeared. And since the objects of science are the same for all intellects, when a geometer has attained the knowledge of the sphere, the intelligible sphere that he contemplates and whose properties he sees does not differ in any way from the sphere that another geometer who has attained the same knowledge contemplates. But if intellects are identical to their objects, and if the objects are uh, themselves identical among themselves, it follows that all intellects are identical. Since the period prior to St. Thomas, this thesis had appeared worrisome to Christian faith. In fact, this faith supposes that each individual taken separately has a supernatural destiny that belongs particularly to him, that each reasonable being merits election or incurs damnation. Aristotle's thesis no longer allows distinguishing human beings from each other by what makes them be human beings, by their reason, but instead only by faculties they have in common with animals and by which they cannot possess merit or demerit. St. Thomas, like all the Christian peripatetics, therefore rejects this thesis. He rejects it by applying his ordinary criterion, disagreement with faith. But in the name of the principle, no truth is contrary to a truth, he had to be able to demonstrate that the thesis is also in disagreement with reason. But it is not at all in disagreement. And Thomas was obliged to admit that this thesis, as Aristotle presented it, flows from the nature of intellect. But he says, even if the intellect of all was unique because it did not contain the natural cause of multiplication, it would still be possible to admit multiplication without contradiction in virtue of a supernatural cause. This passage tells us with all the clarity one could desire that the multiplicity of intellects is a miracle that contradicts the intellect's own nature. The weakness of reason is therefore such that even though it exercises itself in a perfectly correct manner as it does in the present case by deducing the unity of intellect from its nature, it will never be sure of the validity of its conclusions. It is therefore clear that in these conditions, in order to arrive at making the Thomist philosophy a Christian philosophy, one must think that it possesses no conclusion offering us the least security before having been confronted by faith. The Christian must always take into account the supernatural that can render all natural laws merely accidental. The arbitrariness of an all-powerful will that inserts itself at its whim into the tissue of things opposes itself to Hellenism's rational and immovable order. Finally, we find at the end of this account something almost the contrary of what seemed to have been promised us at the start. In place of the autonomy of reason that takes the initiative of philosophical thought, the heteronomy of a reason completely incapable of directing itself and knowing the scope of its own conclusions. This would be at least Thomism's logical conclusion. Inevitably, it was necessary to choose between these two positions. Either submit reason to faith to the point that every systematic and reasoned arrangement of notions becomes completely useless, since the fact of entering into a system of being deduced is not at all the justification of a truth of an affirmation or even a presumption of its favor, or 
admit reason's initiative and the possibility of reason being its own judge. But Thomism did not wish to take either side, and it remains always hesitant and timid between them. He claims to be properly rationalist and intellectualist, and there is in it a positive and realist spirit, a desire to treat philosophical problems without making any transcendent illumination that places us directly in contact with God, intervene, as do the Augustinians. But on the other hand, there is also a complete insecurity in what bears on the results of its inquiry and a near absolute impossibility of establishing a systematic and coherent philosophy. So it's been about 45 minutes of reading, and we've managed to get to page 116. There are still three shorter sections and roughly uh, 11 pages to go. So I think I'm going to end the reading here, but I'm happy to take questions, comments for about the next 15 minutes uh, before we round out the hour. Um, hello to Ricky and Mark and everybody else who's here. So what we've seen is, is uh, Bre here is saying, if we want to figure out whether there really is Christian philosophy, we need to look at the contenders. And he begins by looking at Augustine as being sort of like the paradigmatic um, patristic figure that is the, the, among the church fathers. And then he jumps all the way to the 13th century and examines uh, the reception of Aristotelianism and St. Thomas Aquinas. Um, as we're going to see people pointing out um, in subsequent parts, his, his history is actually not as great as he pretends it to be. Um, he's kind of misinterpreting Augustine and um, the church fathers. It's a little bit debatable about the, the Thomas stuff. I mean, I, I kind of think that some of his stuff is perhaps a bit more on point um, than the dismissals of him by the Thomas, Gilson, Maritain, um, you know, von Steinbergen, Sertian, some of the other people dismissing him have, have done. I will say this, though. Um, when they had the actual debate in the Société Française de Philosophie, Gilson basically played Socrates to um, Brehier's pick whatever figure who's getting his, his butt handed to him by Socrates. Um, Brehier basically contradicted himself, showed that he, he was wrong about and didn't understand quite a bit about um, the, the history that he was, he was talking about, which did not look good for him. Unfortunately, the Société Française de Philosophie allows only the translations of the presentation by Gilson and the appended letter by, by Blondel, not the actual debate between um, Gilson and Brahier, not Maritain's presentation, which shows up basically in uh, his essay on Christian philosophy, and not the uh, back and forth between uh, Gilson and uh, Braunschweig. But what are you going to do? All right, uh, so this is an interesting question for, by, by Mark. In terms of the epistemological relation between faith and reason, how would you say the will fits in in a Christian context? So we have to, we have to know what we mean by the will, and I would say that um, the will is not something, to begin with, the will as a reality is not something simple. And for the other part, the will is understood differently by different thinkers. So the will is understood by Augustine is not precisely the same thing, although it covers a lot of the same ground as the will understood by St. Thomas or by Anselm or Boethius. Um, there's, there's interconnections, but they're not exactly the same. And we could extend this further. The Descartes, Hobbes, clearly very different conceptions of of will there. Um, I think that, that this is this is a really interesting point. In these Christian philosophy debates, you could say that they were much more oriented towards thinking out these matters with a focus on what you can call theoretical or speculative philosophy, you know, metaphysics, epistemology, and there was less of a coherent focus. I don't want to say there was no focus, but less of a coherent focus on practical philosophy, on ethics, on even aesthetics or other things. And 
Gilson discusses some of these things in his um, Spirit of Medieval Philosophy, which is another major contribution to the, to the uh, debates. And obviously, Blondell is going to highlight the will. But most of the other interlocutors really didn't. Um, I mean, you see discussion of will here in Brehier's stuff, but it's not the human will that's being talked about, right? It's the divine will. And what is the relation between the human and the divine will? At best, analogous, if not completely equivocal. Um, so I don't know if that, if that really answers the question, um, but I'll say that at least in these debates, there was not as much discussion as we probably would have liked of the nature of the will. Now, later on, um, some thinkers who are approaching these topics will indeed talk a good bit about the will. And I have in mind somebody like Dietrich von Hildenbrand, right, who is too young to participate in these debates. Um, he's a student of, of Mach Shaler's, and he will go on and become a very important uh, uh, Catholic phenomenologist in the 20th century. And he participates in some discussion about Christian philosophy later on. I actually have a, a paper that I... I don't think I ever did publish on Dietrich von Hildenbrand and Christian philosophy and these, these debates and, and how to understand his position. And he, he devotes a lot of attention to the will and to the heart. Um, had Mach Shaler been around long enough to, to involve himself, and he might have, might well have, um, he probably would have had something interesting to say. So... All right, uh, Ricky says, is G Giordano Bruno mentioned? No, not really much. I mean, he's he's a marginal figure, really, in the history of philosophy. Um, so, yeah. Uh, Mark says, is faith a matter of will, or to use Greek faculties, nous or logos? It's not, a, it's not really just one of any of those sort of things. And again, we have to be careful when we talk about nous or logos. They are not the same thing for for Greek thinkers, I mean the um, the noose of the uh, of Aristotle is not always the same thing. Even in Aristotle, I wouldn't. I'd be careful like translating noose in Nicomachean Ethics Book Six as the same thing as noose in in some other places. Sometimes he's being loosey goosey with it. Um, it's not the same thing as when when a Stoic uses noose or logos. It's not the same thing as when a Neoplatonist uses it. Um, faith it can be understood in a number of different ways. It can be understood in terms of belief. It can be understood in terms of action. It can be understood as a virtue. And not, these are, you know, analogously related to each other. Um, Mark asks, I mean, did the Christian thinkers drawing on the Greeks ever offer interpretations of where faith fits in? Many. Yeah, I mean, the church fathers are are full of this, but they don't just talk about faith. They also talk a lot about love, you know, caris or caritas or um, agape. And, and, you know, faith is not something that exists on its own, like, you know, a product that you can pick up or uh, like use an example, a mask you can put on, you know, as a matter of fact, those metaphorical things that are in Paul's letters about, you know, put on the breastplate of this and the helmet of this. I think that's those the Christians, you know, read those and then they get themselves all bollocked up because they think that the there there is something like, you know, putting on the the, the mask of of faith or, you know, drinking from the water bottle of love or something like that. Um, these refer to complex realities within human beings that then we try to conceptualize and we name, but we have to be very attentive to in our, our analyses. Uh, ask Ida, when's the next reading? Good question. I haven't put any new readings on the calendar. I probably should look at that. Before classes began, it was pretty easy for me to do uh, Thursday readings. Let me see what my Thursdays look like. I can probably keep doing these Thursday readings uh, at the same time. 
um, because I have stuff up until noon, noon my time, whatever time it is uh, uh, where you are. Um, like for Mark, it's evening because it's um, he's in South Africa. So I'll probably I'll keep doing these weekly readings. If I get super busy, I may have to space them out a bit more. Um, we're moving to the season of Stoicism. And Andy, my, my wife, and I are organizing Stoicon itself, as well, as well as I'm the editor of Stoicism today. So that, that keeps me pretty busy. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll keep up with these. I didn't know whether I would get through, as it turns out, I didn't, uh, all of um, Brahir's presentation. I think probably more than just Brahir's thing is going to have to be broken up, like Gilson's. The notion of Christian philosophy, is that doable in a single session? Yeah, yeah, because it's only it's only uh, 12 pages. Blondell's, uh, does Christian philosophy exist as, as philosophy? We can do that. But his, is there a Christian philosophy, is from page 150 to page 175. Probably have to break that one up into two. Etienne Bourne's on a Christian philosophy that would be philosophical is pretty short. Um, Blondel's The Problem of Catholic Philosophy, you know, The Meeting of the Société d'Etudes Philosophique. Well, that's a long one. And that's got discussions with uh, Blondel, Pallier, Berger, um, his responses to a bunch. So that's going to have to be broken up into quite a few. And then the, the later ones, I think these are all fairly short and can be done in a single session of readings. Yeah, that, that, that's doable. And I'm not going to read the bibliography. That would be mind-numbingly boring. Uh, Moxian, do you have any opinion on the LGBTQ uh, plus? The, irrelevant to what we're doing here. Obviously, I have opinions, but uh, we're not going to discuss them here. Mark Smith, looking forward to the Blondell reading. Uh, still trying to get my hands on a copy of Blondell's Action. Um, yeah, you know, I'll tell a funny story about Blondell's Action. So that was his dissertation, right? His 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 French dissertation, because back then you had to do a Latin dissertation, which he did on Leibniz's vinculum, uh, the, the chain connecting things. And then he wrote Action, 1893, which almost didn't pass <laughs> and actually got him in trouble with the French philosophical establishment. Um, got him like sent out to the boonies after they put him on ice for two years, didn't give him a job. Um, so Axion 1883, they printed out, you know, the first edition and I, like a print run of like maybe a thousand or so. And they like sold like hotcakes. They were gone, right? You couldn't get your hands on them. William James came to France and he, he was like, can I get a copy of this book that everybody's talking about? And people were like, nope, not giving you my copy. He wrote to Blondell and he said, hey, man, uh, you got any extra copies? And Blondell sent him a copy and said, I'm going to need this back when you're done with it. Afterwards, James found out that that was Blondell's only existing copy. And that Blondell was willing to like, you know what it's like when you lend books. Oftentimes you don't get them back, you know. And the fact that somebody's a famous philosopher doesn't make it any more likely they're going to return your books. So James afterwards returns the book and, and Blondell's like, Whew. Glad you returned it because uh, I don't have any other copies left. <laughs> so it sometimes can be a, a hard book to get your hands on. So on that, we'll we'll leave off that. That's a great story uh, with two great thinkers. Uh, Mark says lending books is true charity. <laughs> that's that's a that's a great point. All right, so I will see you all hopefully for another reading next week, and I'll put it in the calendar. Um, and thanks for hanging in there. This is kind of a long slog with, with Brayer, although I, his, he is a good stylist, I will say. So, all right, I'll see you later.